Hello, Monetization Nation. Sydney Tetro is a highly successful entrepreneur and digital monetizer. The art of storytelling and how to apply it for business growth and market leadership is woven throughout her career. She led technology commercialization at Disney and helped build a Facebook app with more than 100 million users. She founded a 3D printing personalization platform named 3D Plus Me, founded a simulation platform named Forge DX, and started a nonprofit all while contributing to her community and raising children. She's been recognized as a woman of the year, contributor of the year, and one of the top 10 coolest entrepreneurs. She received Stevie Awards for Entrepreneur of the Year and Innovator of the Year, and has been recognized as a most successful businesswoman to watch. Cindy said in our interview, if you can't control your destiny, then it's hard for you. You have momentary success, but you're not in control of the outcome. In this interview, Sydney discusses four foundations she has implemented in her work to build skyscrapers. These four foundations are one, being consumer driven and creating experiences and connection. Number two, growing ecosystems of influence. Number three are conversions without friction. And number four is the success based pricing model to help generate recurring revenue. Tectonic shifts are constantly transforming the earth and business, causing destruction and huge growth opportunities. I'm Nathan William, the host of Monetization Nation, where we learn how to leverage business tectonic shifts to transform monetization. Hi, Sydney. How are you? I am fabulous. Thank you so much for making time to join, join me today. Oh, well, you know, it's only taken us two months. <laughs> but we got <laughs> This book is going to be much better with, with your involvement. Yeah. Are you still working at Disney? I've, I've been looking at your LinkedIn profile here. Tell me what you're doing right now. Yeah. So let's see. No, I worked at Disney for about five years. Right. Um, when I left Disney, I did a 3D printing company called 3D Plus Me that we sold to White Clouds. And then about three years ago, I started a new venture around a kind of um, – technology really it was a product demo platform really used by a large enterprise called forge dx one of the one of the core secrets of this book i'm writing is about building a skyscraper on land you own and i learned that lesson when you and i were working together uh, for paul allen at family link and how uh, we came in we through not I'm not taking credit for this, but a group of talented people came in together and we added $5 million of new revenue in that first 12 months, Right, built something huge, fourth largest Facebook app. Um, what it was it? 60 million app installs or something like that. Yeah, we had that. hundred million, 23 million oh. monthly actives. Good. Wow. And then Facebook decided, thanks for proving that people really want this functionality. So we're going to build it into our core offering. And then all these millions of people, tens of millions of people that have installed it on their homepage, we're going to remove it. Even though they chose to install it, yeah. we're going to unilaterally remove that and have more <laughs> our technology instead of yours. And uh, just a great example of that concept. You just can't trust a platform to build your business or your skyscraper upon a platform. You've got to Build your skyscraper on a platform you own. That's right. You've got to, yeah, if you can't control your destiny, then it's hard for you to ever. Yeah. Like you end up, you end up with momentary success, but not in control of outcome. That's right. And the more successful you become, the greater the chances that it's going to get taken away from you. You look at Amazon and uh, they, they let, they open up their platform. They let all these different vendors sell on their platform. And then they took all of the successful ones or, or many of the most successful ones and went and created competing products. And yep. you know, yeah, they just watch what wins and then they make their Amazon version of it. Yeah, that's right. So it's, it's not a good long-term strategy. Yep. You're right. Amazon's probably the best example, right? They eat, they eat the whole ecosystem, right? Trans now they're in transportation and logistics. Yeah, that's right. And, and Facebook has done it multiple times. They did it to their app people. And then they did it to all the people that built Facebook pages. You know, we spent all that money and built all the huge reach. Yeah. And all of a sudden they said, well, now you have to pay to reach the followers who already subscribed and said they wanted to follow you. And we already paid Facebook to buy that follower. And now we have to pay them again to send an email to them. It just, they changed the rules when, when it becomes to their financial advantage. 
Absolutely. It was kind of interesting listening you go as you went through that. So the last, so when I was at Disney, right, a lot, I was doing technology commercialization, right? Like how do we build businesses out of this technology stuff? But a big part of what I kind of became grounded in there is the way that Disney does storytelling and how that becomes pervasive and how they build relationships for businesses, for customers, for their guests, right? Because this, it's um, it built into their DNA, right, is um, that, that customer connection. But it kind of leads through a number of years. Like that organization is completely built around everything that you do about, you know, guest satisfaction. When I was there, the fastest way to kill a project is if someone said that will create guest dissatisfaction, you would know it would no longer move forward. Like that was because everything was ingrained in you about the customer. It's not just their first, because some people do that, but that you are creating a guest experience. And if you do everything right about that guest experience, you build long-term connection with them so much so that you never break the bond. And once I, and we, you can pause me in a second, tell me stories, but just for kind of context, when I left there, the company that we built around 3D printing was completely grounded in this idea that and this one was a little bit more B to C. So we built a software platform where you could become your favorite superhero or character. And the entire way we sold that was around how can you, for but a moment, um, help someone see themselves and immerse them in their favorite storylines and create this experience that truly transformed them because they're loyal to Iron Man because they see themselves in that and there is this story that they bond with. And so even in the experience that we created from software, it was this immersive moment where everything that you did for a moment, you saw your transformation into Iron Man. And when we sold that product, you know, like when we show up at the Super Bowl, because we took the product to the Super Bowl and the World Series and Hasbro built this custom toy line for us. But that one's all about this transformational experience that you can create. And that was very consumer driven. That product launched into like Toys R Us and Walmart and um, Target and a whole bunch of, uh, um, and we had like, how we had Marvel, Star Wars, the NFL, the MLB, Halo, like all of those brands, but it was very connection to um, how do you create this emotional connection long-term with that. But then when I left that company, I kind of took that same methodology and we applied it into B2B enterprise. So for the last three years, everything that I've been doing is what we call kind of technology storytelling, which is this idea that if I'm selling technology, no one ever buys features and functions. What they buy is what that technology enables that aligns with their business outcomes and the customer experience that they're trying to create. And experience can actually be customers, it can be employers, employees, it can be your supply chain. But what we did is we built these visualizations that showed the power of technology tied to business outcomes. And the very first one we actually ever did was for the CIO of Target for Verizon showing him how Verizon's technology aligned with where his end goals were to create transformation. And we grounded everything in the stories around all the things that you're actually talking about, meaning things like, you know, this isn't features and functions, you're building strategic relationships grounded in an experience that isn't just a moment in time. We were actually working with the Miami Dolphins and their CEO at the time used this term of, you, you're trying to create ubiquitous exclusivity in your experiences because what you want is every person to have an exclusive experience, but you want that for everyone. And so it became all about how you create these immersive moments that create these ahas. And so every story we ever built was around how powerful can that experience be such that people come back? How do you drive them from step one to step two and keep them engaged in every leg of their customer journey? Not because you gave them a better price. You're never competing on price. Right. In Verizon's case, they're always the most expensive, but they won the deals because you could show experience that would change the behavior of their customer and tie those customers to their to their customers, which in turn was the reason you would purchase the technology. So this was a, um, a case where we actually experimented with a series of things that are kind of interesting. We happened to have this opportunity to launch the product at Comic-Con in San Diego. And so we launched the product at Comic-Con in San Diego because a partner of ours let us get a 10 by 10 space and they're like 60 by 60 booth. They're like, Sid, we'll put you on the corner and um, you come in and you've got Marvel and let's, and we, we somehow, this was like crazy fast timing, also launched an exclusive character, which was called MODOK. He's like the mechanized organism designed only for killing. 
he's a special Disney character, or he's a special Marvel character that is only like comic people know. So we launched this at Comic-Con. And this is like our unveiling moment, right? And we're, we have, remember like we have no customers, right? This is our first introduction and we have 10 by 10 space. Well, we end up with like lines, like miles long of people coming to this immersive experience to get, become a character, Iron Man, et cetera. When you think about ecosystems of influence, so my partner, 3D Systems, right? They let me have a 10 by 10 square of theirs. And because I had a partnership with Marvel, Marvel comes over and they, they go through the process and they transfer a bunch of the guys from their podcast the Marvel podcast that transform, see themselves transform into MODOK and Iron Man and they video it and it goes immediately into their, it's actually still up on their YouTube channel around them transforming into these characters and like going through this magical experience and they see this whole digital experience and then we printed in full color 3D print their physical characters so they could have themselves. And what we found in those moments are when you have completely so it's always true, right? If you can get completely the right target customer, right? And they are complete, they're the right customer and you've got the right experience, then you get all of the acquisition that you want, right? You get lines of people coming. And then because there's lines of people and you've got people like Marvel endorsing you and a partner who pitched me your booth, that was, the, that was the place. And this was our very first launch where I ended up getting a deal with Hasbro out of it to create a custom toy line. I deal with Walmart to go test inside of the Walmart um, facilities for and so this this happens in the end of June and as an outcome of that I get this phone call that says hey said you guys think you could launch how many Walmarts do you think you can launch in for superhero September which was in 60 days <laughs> and we had like launched our very first like little thing right like you can imagine there were like still lots of bugs in our system and um, but this ecosystem of, and, it, and it, you know, it kind of goes under, I don't know which kind of, you'll, you can figure that out, but it was this very, it was a very interesting company because it was so built on relationships and influence of a bigger pie, right? One that I didn't fully own, but the accelerated opportunity. So Walmart calls and asks us that. And I was sitting in the company and I'm like, you know, one of the challenges I'm faced with is my price point is like, I sold it at Comic-Con for like 120 to $180 a unit. We won't talk about recurring revenue on this one just yet, but that was yep. like the initial price point. And I'm like, I can never sell that at a, tar at a demo price inside of Walmart. What are we going to do? And so I realized that the only way to get into Walmart was because, and that was, this was because the economics of 3D printing were also really still that expensive that your price point um, was high if you were to get a physical object. And so then I decided that I needed a toy line in order to go to Walmart to decrease my price. The only way to get a toy line in 60 days was to partner with Hasbro. So I cold call into Hasbro. Um, actually, that's not true. I cold called into them and then they had, but they had seen us at Comic-Con. And so we call into them and we find the guy who's been talking about 3D printing. And I'm like, Kenny, um, so Walmart wants to do Superhero September. I think we need your help. Do you think we could pull this off? Will you partner with us? Can we do something? We ended up pulling it off. We launched in 20 Walmarts around the country, 60 days after our initial launch. And we rallied all of those guys. Marvel gave us the approval. Hasbro let us use a toy line and create custom heads for those. We deployed inside of Walmart's infrastructure. And we had a super successful launch that catapulted the company into a whole bunch of other retailers. But it was very much because of this ecosystem of influence. And that ecosystem kind of time and time again allowed us to monetize. Because of that success um, and the end, I would also say it wasn't just success, but you the partners saw the value in what you were creating, right? It was for the Marvel brand, for them to see, for customers to see themselves as their favorite character, right? You can never become Tony Stark, right? But you can like, you know, you yourself can like put that uniform on and, and, be, and become that. And so that like elevated the Marvel story, which then in turn elevated their interest in helping you acquire other partnerships. Right, so that very quickly led us to deploying into Toys R Us. It led to, so in the, the interesting thing about that one, because a little bit of you know startup land is always like, how do we get this done? So to make that happen, how, we used the Titan characters from Hasbro, but they couldn't build them for us because we only had 60 days. So we took existing characters and we figured out how to retrofit 3D printed heads 
on these superhero figures to launch them into the, the product and created custom packaging and all of that. But we had to manually pop up all of the heads and put the 3D printed heads on them in order to hit that time frame. But the well, success of that led Hasbro to create a, a custom toy line for us a year later. So once we did that, we actually ended up creating a whole custom toy line that launched into other retailers the following holiday season because of the success of that moment. Congratulations. I'm glad you're using Tony Stark as an example because <laughs> definitely uh, Team Iron Man. He's definitely my favorite uh, superhero. Well, and there's this interesting thing in that the credibility influence because especially when you're a new company, um, there's risk, right? People who make decisions, especially for large deals, there's risk on you when you're a new company. And so when you can build trusted relationships and someone does a transaction with you, then that you get the credibility of building that relationship. And then they're like, well, wait, if you're working with them, then it's okay for us to work with you. Um, in the company that I was most recently building, we, um, we had created really strong relation and I'm okay, I think using these names, we created a really strong relationship with Adobe and they were using the product demo platform. <clears throat> and it happens that at one of the events, the Microsoft team saw the platform being used. And they're like, how are you building those product demos? And Adobe said, oh, we're using this platform. And Microsoft said, oh, we should be using that platform too. And within 30 days, they had signed up for their first simulation subscription. And we saw that time and time again in, in that company that we built. You know, we had really big blue chip customers. But when someone, when you build trusted relationships and you deliver value, then it becomes a reference that you don't even have to talk about because you can just talk about how someone's using it. And then that in turn allows you to get the credibility that you need at the next partner. Okay, so let me restate this and make sure I'm getting this. So you're saying as a new startup company or even as an established company trying to go into a new, into a new space, mm -hmm. um, you can leverage the credibility of others and their credibility can flow through you like the Marvel credibility flowed through you because you did the partnership and then that gives you more credibility to establish additional relationships such as the relationship you did with Walmart. Great example. Love it. That's a really good point. Um, talk to me about conversions. Um, have you guys worked with sales funnels and follow-up email funnels and advertising funnels? Um, any advice on that process to convert a click to a maximized lifetime value customer. Yeah, so for one of the really large companies, which we probably can't print in the book, we were we built a, um, so we remember I'm building all these like interactive technology story kind of experiences, really mm -hmm. grounded in technology product demos. And I, we all, I always kind of live by a couple of rules. One is people, they want to learn information, but they don't like friction and they don't really like to think. So they want to experience something, but they don't want to have to solve it for you. So anytime something is complicated, right? Anytime something is more of a hurdle than the value you were going to give me, I'm out, right? And, yep. and that has been true in all the things that we created. And so we created this demo for, um, you probably can't print their name, but it was for Adobe okay. on their Magento.com site. And they were looking for a product demo to be high converting. And we kind of followed these principles of so what are the four thing, what are the four biggest value propositions that people don't know that they have to know in order to close the sale? Because I think oftentimes we think about it like we want people, we just want to tell people these things. But ultimately what customers are looking for in a funnel is what's the information they need at a given point in time to move to the next step. And you yeah. never move someone from step one to 10 unless it's an impulse purchase at the all at the same time. So you have to be very aware of someone needs this information to make the decision, the next decision, whatever it is. You know, and in a funnel where you're in enterprise software, someone gets interested, then they probably need to see something in action, but they need to see something that is tells them enough about what it does so they can make an educated decision if they want to talk to someone. That's typically how that enterprise funnel is working. And so we 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 worked with them on creating this product demo that was really focused on what are the four things someone has to know in order to understand the unique value that you're providing that will help them want to engage with you further? 
I think we often forget that. That's really all that matters. What information do you need in order to go to the next step? So we created this demo um, that targeted the four things that were really unique about Magento and the reason someone would purchase them. And the demo ends up performing at 300% better than anything else they've had. And it has 28% better form fills than any other form they have on their websites. Wow. Simply because it was, and it was, and there was all this design kind of strategy that went into how do you make it interactive, but not difficult? How do you make it really easy for someone to feel like they've jumped in and they've learned something and they got to control the storyline? So we were, we've always been around, how do you help someone un, almost like choose your own adventure, but in such a simple way that it's just easy, yeah. right? That it makes sense for them. And so those kind of core elements, because people hate friction. And the moment you have friction with no value, people just leave you, right? They just bounce off of your site. And so you got to be really attuned to something that is, oh, yep, I get it. I understand. I, I should do that next step. Oh, I got the value in that next step. Um, because every time that it's harder, you lose people. And that's really when you lose your conversion funnels. Great answer. Thank you for sharing. Uh, last question um, is, is shift number eight is the recurring revenue. Uh, you mentioned a little bit that you know that's a story for another day when you referred to recurring revenue. Uh, can you share with me any any good examples of recurring revenue that you've seen? I mean, uh, World Vital Records was a good example of recurring revenue. Um, yeah, I probably have, so I probably have an example on both sides just that might be interesting. So in the three D plus me world, because we were selling physical product, getting to a recurring revenue model was really difficult, and it was also the number one thing that hurt the valuation of the company. Yes. Right. So they were, they were, sales, it's hard to have anything to sell. Exactly. And what I, you know, as I went into that business, not having really been in like the toy world before or that collectible world, what you learned is that, you know, companies like a Hasbro, they might have an action figure that at a given Walmart only sells a couple, but they have 60,000 retailers on any given day, right. That are selling that product. And so they, what they have is built platforms of mass distribution and access from all over to a product, right? So for them, the recurring revenue or for big companies like that, whether it's, you know, any of those large toy manufacturers, they don't have, a re those products don't have recurring revenue, but the channel does, right? Because there's different ways to handle recurring revenue. It either comes on product purchases based on success of delivery, because you could ultimately consider something like, oh, we're going to buy from you X number of product every quarter because it performs, right? That's similar to a recurring revenue model. Uh, but when I was a small retailer, it's like, okay, well, now I sell one MLB character to you for 160 bucks. How do I get you back, right? What are you subscribing to? Because in order to get someone on a subscription, you have to have someone with frequency, some product that has enough frequency for value. Um, that was a code we could not crack. And in the way that we had approached the business model, it just had a pure physical limitation on what, what you could do around that. And at the time I watched other companies like Loot Crate who were in kind of a similar gamer, gamer kind of space. They were very early on in the box businesses, the subscription boxes, and they created some around like uh, all, all of the worlds that we were in fantasy and comic and, and things like that. And they grew wildly successful very rapidly because for 20 bucks a month or $14.99, whatever the price was, you know, you got this comic collection um, every month. But we couldn't quite crack the code because we were personalized and product. But when I built the next company, we said, okay, while we're building these product demos, we're not going to think about them as one-time product demo builds. We're going to think about them as we're going to build a platform underneath them that you're subscribing to, which is what gives everyone access to the demo. And every time you build a demo, it's on the platform and everything's about how you access from the platform, how you demo from the platform, how it's embedded from the platform, so and how you give access to hundreds of thousands of users, internal or external, to see those product demos. And so that allowed us to build into it a subscription model where even up front you could, um, and then we actually started to follow a, in the way we did it is we, we took kind of a, um, a page out of Microsoft's book where what Microsoft does on subscription is you would, or on some product lines, um, is you can sign up, you can purchase first product and it might have a lower entry price, but at the end of year one, they actually do a true up based on what your usage was. And you don't pay for what you did use, 
you pay for that as a forecast of the second year. So you, because what you're really about in recurring revenue where we were was, we didn't want everyone to have to think about, so we priced per simulation, not per user, because we wanted every person to use the demos. Because if all thousands of your employees use the demos, it becomes a mission critical application. And then it's viral loop too. Exactly. It, it spreads. When they go to their next company, they take it with them and tell that employer exactly. that they- Exactly, and it exactly, it was doing that. And so, you know, you get large company, they roll it out to tens of thousands of people. It got its stickiness. And then in second year, you're like, oh, well, you know, it's been super successful. And now you've got 16 demos of deployed on the platform, thousands of users every month. Um, and now that's forecasting what we think the next year will be. And so we did this modified subscription where you always took one year up front at this baseline price. But when it hit two second year, the platform fee for the subscription was based on how successful you've been for the previous year and became a really successful way to build a recurring revenue model in a way that had a low cost of entry, but um, allowed you to capture the value over time. That is brilliant. Having a success-based pricing model instead of a per, I always hate per user pricing models. And you're right, you, that discourages your viral loop, that discourages your ability to spread and, and be as successful as, as you possibly can for that organization. Exactly, it's, your, it's a natural limiter. Right, you're like per user, then you're like, oh crap, who should use it? These three people, these four people. And in our case, we're like, no, you want every person to use it. Don't limit, don't limit, don't make someone think about how they have to pay for a user, but every person use it because if they use it and you did your job, they'll keep using it. That's right. That's really smart. So that's a great example of how you're thinking of the long-term lifetime value of, of the customer and not just the short-term, you know, per user Rather fee. Thing. Yeah. Love it. Okay, thank you for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really appreciate it. It's great to talk to you. Okay, bye. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Sydney, for sharing your stories and strategies about building your skyscrapers with us today. Here's some of my key takeaways from today's episode. Number one, always be focused on the consumer. How can we give them the best experience possible and create a stronger connection? Work to give ubiquitous exclusivity in customer experiences. Number two, when we build trusted relationships and deliver value, then it becomes a point of credibility because we can just talk about how the other credible organization is using our service. That in turn allows us to attain the credibility we need with the next partner. Number three is ecosystems of influence. They make it a lot easier for a company to monetize time and time again, not having to do everything ourselves. Number four, anytime something is complicated, or more of a hurdle than the value you're going to give to the customer, people say, I'm out. We need to make sure to keep things as simple as possible for the user. Eliminate all of the friction we can. Number five, don't give the customer all of the information at once. Instead, focus on what information a customer needs to make the next decision or take the next step. Number six, explore a success-based subscription model to start a viral loop and improve the long-term lifetime value of the customer. Did you like today's episode? Then please subscribe to the Monetization Nation e-magazine for free to receive more great content about becoming a better digital monetizer. If we desire monetization we have never before achieved, we must implement strategies we have never before implemented. I challenge each of us to choose one tip that has resonated with us from today's episode and schedule a time this week to learn more about it to help achieve our monetization goals. How have you seen companies position themselves to be masters of their own destinies? Please join our private Monetization Nation Facebook group and share your insights with other digital monetizers. Do you want to become a better digital monetizer? To receive great monetization stories and secrets, please go to monetizationnation.com and join free. And if you liked today's episode, please subscribe to the show and share it.